Filmmaker Ann Shin embedded herself with a human smuggler named Dragon and followed two North Koreans as they attempted to escape to freedom in South Korea. And we now welcome Ann Shin, director of the documentary The Defector, Escape from North Korea, which has its world premiere next Wednesday, 9 p.m. here on TVO. And it's great to meet you and congrats on the documentary. Thanks for having me on the show. We had a big all staff meeting last week and they played some highlights from the documentary and it looks absolutely sensational. So Thanks for good for that. you for getting it done. Uh, I'd actually propose that we start this by showing everybody else out there what we've already seen. Let's so do that. let's have a clip. Roll tape, please. Where does the personal interest in telling this story come from, from your point of view? Well, I'm of Korean background. My parents are from South Korea, but um, I heard a lot of stories about Korea before it was divided between North and South. So I had an aunt and uncle who were socialists at a time when, uh, you know, socialists and Democrats were squaring off against each other and they suffered greatly for their ideals. They had to flee to the North and then the North... Say that again. They fleed from the South yes, to the North. Yes. We're talking about 40, 50 years ago, I guess. Yes, eh? exactly. Yeah. Okay. Because the South was a dangerous place back then. Yeah. Well, the, there were there were during the Korean War they had to flee, for sure, for sure, and then they uh, were not trusted in the North because they came from the South and were their land and property was in the South. Of course, it had all been confiscated, but they had to flee back south and they suffered greatly. They were tortured a couple times. So the story about exile and, and escape is something that resonates with me. Of course, um, stories about North Koreans escaping today are. It's one with much higher stakes, and uh, when I first heard about how many had been escaping, I, I really felt compelled to try and tell that story and share it with a wider, wider audience. And to do so, you had to gain the trust of some people who are really very inside um, this whole process of smuggling people out. How did you do that? Uh, I knew. I, I started research by meeting um, North, North Korean defectors that lived in Canada. And um, through them and the network of people I was meeting, they were referring me to people in South Korea and also in China. And uh, there were people who worked in churches and NGOs, and they were also guides or brokers, or some may call smugglers. And one of them was this fellow named Dragon. What would you call him? I guess I would call him a human smuggler, but I would say, or a guide, I'd say that my understanding of that term has changed dramatically having made this film. From what to what? I used to think human smugglers are people who take advantage of other people. They're vermin. <laughs> you know, I used to think that. But um, during the course of this film, I realized, you know, people who smuggle other people, who, who, who want to be smuggled, who will pay them a fee to be smuggled across borders, are filling in a need where governments and NGOs are failing. There are many undocumented migrants or illegal migrants or people who need, who are need to seek refugee status and who are not making it to safe countries on their own. And the people who smuggle them are the people who are interest me. They're ambivalent. They, they are taking a fee, but at the same time, they're helping these people find freedom. And this fellow named Dragon, why would he, I mean, what's in it for him to have his story put up on the big screen like this? You know, I'm not sure. I got to tell you, when I first met him, though, um, I had talked to him, talked with him over the phone, and yeah, yeah, unlike most most documentary processes, I had to cast sight unseen. I had to cast over the phone and by, you know, word of mouth, the people vouching for him. So I meet him. He's wearing one of those shiny jogging suits. He's got three cell phones, <laughs> and he's got uh, you know a fake tattoo of a dragon. And so he's the worst stereotype of everything yeah. you can kind of imagine. In this. Yeah, I don't know about you, but. I don't know how you can trust anyone with more than one or two cell phones. Three is just, you know, what's going on here? Okay. But uh, he, um, he really knew, knew his stuff. 
like I could tell immediately that uh, he, he knew all the roots, he had all these connections, he'd done this many times and he'd done it and gotten people out safely. So it was very easy to trust that you know, he would safeguard everyone involved. But why does he want to have, I mean presumably his sources and methods are, are jealously guarded secrets, so why they would he are. risk having those told? In some ways, I think he wanted his story told as well, because he's quite a remarkable individual. Uh, love him or hate him, he's quite remarkable in what he does. And he, too, was a defector. So he still has family that he's trying to support. He's, he's still, you know, he's still got a lot on his shoulders. And, and so the story of hardship that all defectors share is also his own. So you had uh, one opinion of him at the beginning of this and presumably a softer spot for him by the time it was all said and done. I think so, yeah. Gotcha. I, I, I'd like to see what you think. <laughs> the defectors. Um, I mean, I presume this is obvious, but let's hear the explanation anyway. Why do they want to leave? Uh, many of them have been imprisoned. Uh, a lot of them had been working for the state in mines and not getting any food or money. So they would have to go to the mines, show up, and put in 12-hour days and not get rations or pay. Is that the case for the women you yes, profile? Yes, yeah, for Yonghee and Sukja, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And that's... Uh, uh, Sukja was actually imprisoned. She had tried... She had a sister who had left to China years ago and had gone missing. So she, you, can, you can find ways to get contact with the outside world through brokers inside North Korea. So you can rent a cell phone. Otherwise, it's illegal for the average North Korean. And she had done this. And she tried to, to call her sister and got caught. And she was imprisoned and tortured for having, just having used a cell phone once. I that, hesitate to ask too much about this, but tortured how? Uh, she was beaten, bruised. She was left, like, she was left uh, on, on the concrete. Like, she was beaten and kicked and everything and, and then left. And um, when her parents came to see her, they were heartbroken and she thought she got to the point where she thought you know if I'm gonna die from this beating so be it I I, I don't want to live anymore we saw from that clip you've of course obscured their identity so yes. people don't know who they are yes how old is she she was 25 hmm. how did you film the actual escape we f we had to film undercover because uh, we didn't want to attract any attention to them or us to, and and so jeopardize their escape so we filmed with uh, DSLR cameras. Which Things is what? That, they're just Canon cameras that look like you're taking still photos uh, while you're on your tour. But you're actually shooting video. Yes, yeah. We often had them slung around our necks and we're just kind of filming that way. That's got to be illegal, I think. Yeah. Yes? Yes, it was illegal. Illegal. We were so constantly afraid. If you got caught, what were you risking? Uh, if we would have if we were caught, we would have been detained and questioned, and our footage would have been confiscated. So I don't know how many days we would have been detained, but my Chinese soundman would have been imprisoned in a Chinese jail, and his career would have been over, and that was a big risk for him. For us, because we're Canadian citizens, you know, I don't think it would have been that onerous. Uh, the footage, though, was a big concern, because there were all these people we had interviewed, whose faces we hadn't obscured yet, and so all their identities were compromised. And that was what really, you know, was uh, concerned us every minute of the shoot. So the implications of failure could have been huge on numerous people's lives. Yes. Yeah. And yet, you took the risk anyway of doing this. How come? Yes. Um, I wanted to be able to show to, mo to Canadians and other people in the Western world how much people are willing to risk to find their way to freedom, how much North Koreans are risking every day. And to show the current situation that upwards of tens of thousands of North Koreans are living today, they're living in hiding without status in China, in Laos, and other countries, trying to find a way to a safe country where they can apply for refugee status. Because of diplomatic relations, China has to repatriate any North Korean defectors they find. So anyone caught in Chinese soil who's North Korean gets sent back and they'll be tortured and imprisoned by North Korean officials. I, is that really the case? Be yes. Because, um, you know, Chi China and North Korea have a complicated relationship, right? They I mean, do. Te technically, they they're do. allies, but, yeah. but even the Chinese think the North Koreans are crazy some of the time. Oh, yeah. So do, yeah. They, do they really send everybody back that they catch? 
It's, it's, that's a great question. In fact, uh, by anecdote, I've heard that uh, Chinese police have actually sometimes, if there's a group of North Korean defectors they found, they might turn a, a blind eye and say, hey, I'm not going to happen to see if you happen to run off, mm -hmm. you know, in the next 10 minutes, uh, which is really heartening to hear. We're all human, and they recognize that. But the state has been, like, North Korea has prevailed upon the state to heighten its security measures and to repatriate defectors, and they have done so. I even recently, just a couple weeks ago, uh, nine defectors were caught in Laos. Some of them were minors. They were turned back to the Chinese border, and the Chinese officials had to repatriate them to, to North Korea. Hmm. Do you still have family in, in the Koreas? I have family in South Korea. In South Korea. Yes. Yeah. Had you been to North Korea before? No. I'm not sure I'm ever going to get there now. Well, I was going to say, you, you, yeah. you can't go back now. No. I mean, not under this regime, right? Yeah. Presumably, yes. they're going to find out about this, and then you're yes. persona non grata. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, could you talk to us about, um, characterize the regime's treatment of defectors under the new Kim, Kim Jong-un, the son? Yeah. Is he worse than his father? Uh, Kim Jong-un has been much, much harsher on those who try to escape the country. He had increased security measures at the northern border. Most people try to escape through the north into China or Mongolia. He's increased security measures. He increased the punishment meted out to those who are caught and brought back. And he increased the punishment meted out to the families of those who are known to have defected. So p even people who are innocent, if they have a relation who has defected, then they could be subject to punishment by their own country. Do you know why he does this? Because, of course, um, you know, there's another school of thought that says, if you want to defect, just go. I mean, mm -hmm. Fidel Castro opened up the prisons at one point, right? And just yes. anybody who wants to go, go. Yeah. And you raise a great point, because in the 90s, when famine was the hardest, uh, famine was the worst in North Korea, there was a almost a kind of a blind eye policy, turn a blind eye policy at the border. People were crossing over into China just to get a meal overnight and come back or to get medicines because there's, you don't get Tylenol or aspirin in North Korea, let alone antibiotics or any other drugs. Um, so there was a lot of that going on and there's a history of that kind of porous movement that's not really well discussed. But um, yeah, now I think that North Koreans who defect are seen as ultimate traitors because they're saying North Korea is not the beautiful, wonderful state that, you know, the propaganda espouses it to be. Mm -hmm. the, the people that you chronicle in your film happen to be women, but do you know whether most of the people who try to get out are male, female, young, old, what the story is there? The majority are women, and part of that reason is, uh, it's a sad reason because there's a demand for women in China due to the one-child policy. There's a huge gender gap. So there's a lot of men who are not married. So North Korean women have become a, a desirable kind of commodity. They're trafficked, uh, sometimes abducted, and they're sold to Chinese men as brides or sold into the sex industry. And that way, um, unwittingly or sometimes wittingly, North Korean women often you know, have some chance of surviving in China. Dragon doesn't do this, does he? No, Dragon he does not do this. Okay. Uh, most of the defectors who don't end up that way, how do they end up? Uh, in northern China, there is a like an ethnic Korean Chinese group of uh, there's people. It's, it's you know the the ethnic groups have melded over the years and centuries, and so some might end up working on farms as laborers. Some may end up as sold as wives to Chinese men. And they can s eke out a living, so to speak, for short periods of time. But they're really uh, vulnerable to being exploited because if an employer decides not to pay them, and often they do, what can they, they can't do? run to the police. Right. No. Yeah. Do, do many of them end up in the West? A small number of them end up in the West. It's hard to apply for refugee status to a country like Canada or United States. It takes months and months, uh, over a year for sure. And so to be able to live in limbo while waiting for, you know, refugee applications is very difficult. Um, it's hard for them to get here, but there's almost, uh, there are estimates of up to 2,000 North Korean defectors living in Canada now. 2,000 North Korean defectors? Yes. It's, in Canada? It's quite phenomenal. That's quite a yeah. large community given. C considering yeah. they've only started coming to Canada recently. 
Hmm. I don't want to give away the ending here, but you know, people are expecting me, I presume, to ask you, so what happens to the two women and what happens to Dragon? I, you know what? Let's not give it away. Don't tell us what happens to the okay. two women, but I do want to know what happens to Dragon. You can say, okay. is he still doing this? Dragon has stepped out of this business now. He stopped. Yes. He has two children and a wife. And he's now trying to, he's trying to do, make his way with, at another vocation. Do you want to say where he lives? No, I'm not going to say where he lives. Do you want to say what hemisphere he lives in? You don't have to. I'm yeah, not pushing you to do anything. I don't that think he's in the Asian hemisphere anymore. He's left there. I think so, yes. Has he gotten rid of any of his cell phones? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I can't reach he's him He's a now. one cell phone person now? <laughs> one hopes, one <laughs> hopes, yeah. What, um, you know, sometimes people make documentaries and they've told the story and that's it. And I wonder whether you uh, will still feel some obligation as if, or, you know, I don't know if there is or isn't, but do you feel some kind of obligation to sort of follow up with these people and see what's happened to them as the years go by? Yes. I've, um, the journey was really a bonding trip. You, you can't really film undercover on an escape trip and not really bond as a group because trust just happens kind of instantaneously when your lives depend on it. And so I've kept in touch with, with the two of the women, actually three, and Dragon. And the cameraman? Cameraman's here in Toronto. He's, he's hale and happy. <laughs> and the, Ch the, the Chinese sound man is, is doing well as well. Over in China? Yes. Yeah. Good enough. Yeah. That's Ann Shin, producer, director, and writer of The Defector, Escape from North Korea. This documentary airs next Wednesday, 9 p.m. TVO. Thanks, Ann. Thank you, Steve. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.